Hello there. Uh, some of you who've been watching this channel will know that I've been on a bit of a trip. Uh, in fact, I was gone away for 11 weeks on a trip around the world, which I'm very fortunate to have been able to have done. Uh, it's kind of a, a once in a lifetime experience, really, I suppose. So I was able to get three months off of work and uh, go to many places. Um, so I'm 10 stops and all. So I'm going to just do a bit of a recap. So, you know, first of all, I flew to Dublin. And um, Dublin, as you probably know, is the, is the capital city of the Republic of Ireland. It's a Viking city, uh, although, you know, it's very different now from what it used to be. Um, probably 40 years ago, it was still pretty much 40, 50 years ago, it was still a series of, of villages that were sort of connected to each other. There was quite a lot of open space in Dublin, lots of fields still. All of that's gone. It's all been built on. And now that the demographic of Dublin, like many other cities, has changed. It is truly an international city full of people from all over the world, all kinds of races, religions, nationalities, etc. So it has a very different feel from the kind of villagey feel that it used to have back in the 80s and 90s. Um, it's still a, a great place to visit. Um, in particular, if you're interested in history, I, I loved the Dublinia Museum, and I also particularly liked uh, St. St. Mickens. I went with a good friend of mine there. In fact, it was his idea to go there. Um, if you don't know, it's the oldest church in Dublin. It's actually built by the Vikings, in, I think approximately 1095. And it's famous for these money, mummies in the crypt. These sort of strangely preserved by the conditions underground there. The mummified remains were unfortunately desecrated by some crazy Romanian guy, uh, Christian Topiter, I think his name was. He's been charged and could go to prison for 10 years for the irreparable damage he's done. I think he pretty much destroyed five of the mummies. Why he did this has yet to come to light. But it was a a terrible crime. Um, nobody was killed, but in terms of the history of the city, um, the uniqueness of this place is hard to sort of describe. You'd have to go see it for yourself. Um, but, you know, from the point of view of someone who has an interest in history, and particularly Irish history, this is an absolute devastating crime. But anyway, there's, even despite that, there's lots of great places to visit. I think that St. Mickens might be closed to the public for the moment. There'll be a lot of work done to restore uh, the remains, if, if anything can be done to preserve them. Um, what a terrible thing to have done. Anyway, moving on from that, uh, Dublin is a great city. I'd recommend visiting it if you come to Ireland. Uh, but it's also probably one of the most expensive cities in the world. Apart from one other place that I visited, uh, which I'll come to later, I think it is the, uh, the the second most expensive place I went to. Okay, so anyway, from Dublin I flew to London. Uh, London's a city I lived in for 10 years. I've spent many years there, so it's a great city in that uh, there's so much to see. From a tourist point of view, it's absolutely incredible. Um, not so great to live there unless you have to be a wealthy person. Um, it's like Dublin expensive, but perhaps not quite so bad. And um, it's also changed incredibly. Um, it's become very much a sort of rich person's playground. There are areas that, when I lived there, were kind of full of very working class people. Um, I suppose an ethnic group, you might call them, uh, a sort of um, people that had lived in London for many, many generations, going back to the Victorian era and beyond, um, known as Cockneys, uh, have a very distinctive accent and sort of their own kind of culture 
strange kind of clothing that they used to wear this kind of pearly king and queen outfits sort of an odd kind of sorry stylized type of dancing they used to do um quite an interesting people you know very uh sort of based in sort of horses collecting horse brass is a big thing they're into they're also famous for their cockney rhyming slang and playing the spoons and all kinds of strange bizarre things unfortunately uh, london's now kind of emptied out of the cockneys they've all left and been replaced by people from somewhere else and so Lon london's character has changed very much uh, it's still a very interesting city to visit but um you know it's become sort of homogenized in the same way that dublin is that um it's losing some of its individuality some of its unique character as it becomes just a yet another international city that's just like all the other international cities um but it's, i still think it's worth a visit uh it is expensive though um it's it's a very very big city so um one thing it has got in its favor is a very extensive um network of public transport and i think because of these congestion charges that were brought in it's not quite as busy and polluted as it used to be um anyway from there i flew to singapore which was uh, somewhere i've never visited and that was quite an amazing uh trip to go there um i stayed on a little island just to the south of singapore which is sort of a an eco reserve that was really beautiful beautiful beaches very nice and sort of uh, calm and quiet uh, from there you can see across into the city in fact there's a bridge you can walk across which is quite typical of singapore full of plants and like every every space that can hold plants has got plants and trees uh, growing everywhere so this bridge is sort of uh it's you know it's got uh, the monorail i think you can drive across it um you can also uh walk across it and a large section of it as i said is full of plants as well so it's not a very long walk it's uh, taking 10 minutes to cross the bridge and brings you into singapore pro proper um singapore is sort of a strange place in that it's a bit of a shopper's paradise it's full of fancy expensive shops but it's also full of wonders for someone who's interested in horticulture and plants in general everywhere you go skyscrapers big buildings they're absolutely full of plants on the roofs on balconies everywhere the streets are lined with with trees and there's just plants absolutely everywhere it's like a a city in a jungle really it's it's incredible and the botanical gardens i visited um there's many of them um yeah absolutely incredible so um it's very much part of their ethos to sort of um green up the city that was once upon a time very polluted and congested um that's not the case anymore it's really quite beautiful quite amazing and um it didn't seem to have a huge homeless problem unlike both dublin and london which i haven't touched on that yet but anyway i only noticed some homeless people in one place i spent a lot of time walking around the city and um yes yeah, so under a bridge i saw maybe three or four homeless people and that was that was it um so i mean that wasn't pleasant to see but um it's not like a major major problem like you'll find in many other cities uh, i think it's very expensive to buy property there but uh, it didn't seem to be a city that's afflicted with lots of po poverty and certainly um, there's very little evidence of homelessness 
which is obviously a good thing. So anyway, from Singapore, I went to Japan, which I have to say was my favorite leg of my trip. Um, I went to a few cities, uh, Tokyo, uh, Nara, uh, Kyoto, I think Osaka as well. Uh, I went to see uh, Mount Fuji. Anyway, um, Tokyo is the, the obviously the biggest area. That was quite incredible. It, it's enormous. But um, it's hard to describe it really. Uh, I think the, the sort of Tokyo area actually holds um, 38, 000, 38 million people, which is absolutely incredible. But I found it's uh, a very friendly city. Japanese people are incredibly accommodating, very hospitable, and very helpful as well. Uh, I went to look for a particular shrine in one part of Tokyo, and I got lost, and people were very helpful. Um, I also found it's incredibly safe. I didn't see a single homeless person anywhere in Japan. And no evidence of any criminals, no evidence of drug taking or anything like that. I know they do have some social problems in Japan, but it seems to be very well managed, unlike many other cities um, that I've been to. And uh, I think it's four cities I went to in total. Um, there weren't any, any kind of problems with people on the streets or mentally ill people running about or open drug use etc. Uh, everywhere seemed to be fairly well maintained despite the fact that Japan has been in a kind of recession and a sort of uh, financial stagnation since 1990. So if you think about that, that's about approximately 35 years that their economy has been in big trouble and yet um, there's no real evidence of disintegration or um, a failure to maintain the structures of normal life. They seem to have managed to cope with it incredibly well, which maybe suggests that we're doing something wrong in many Western countries where, you know, they haven't, cities that haven't suffered the same economic problems yet, you've got, you know, thousands of homeless people you know, sleeping on the street, uh, people with mental health problems who should be in hospital, uh, you know, drug addicts who, again, should probably be in hospital, just allowed to wander freely, live live in tents, live on park benches, uh, with no, no real help available for them, uh, and nothing done about the problem. Uh, and the same with wild crime rates in some of these cities, too. So I was very impressed with Japan and the general kind of friendliness and sort of very civilized behavior of the Japanese people. I thought they were fantastic. I felt it was an incredibly safe place to be. You could go out at night and not worry about uh, running into any trouble, which wasn't the case everywhere I went. Okay, so from Japan, um, I flew to Brisbane, but I spent very little time there, so um, I couldn't really tell you a whole lot about Brisbane. Uh, I went to visit a, a good friend in um, in Melbourne. I spent quite a bit of time there, and together my me and my friend Steve, we went to Uluru, which was quite breathtaking and an amazing insight into the Aboriginal people and their culture, how they lived, and um, it really is unique, the Aboriginal culture in the whole world. I mean, um, they basically lived um, a hunter-gatherer lifestyle, which would have been similar to what cave people would have lived. Um, they've been so isolated for 
you know, thousands and thousands of years. Uh, I think the first white people that went into the centre of Australia was around 1871. So for all that time, they've just lived in splendid isolation, living entirely off the land. And they didn't do any agriculture. They just gathered and hunted. They also um, just made things out of wood. They didn't have any pottery. Uh, they hadn't uh, any kind of uh, agricultural techniques as well. And um, so they had a very, a very, very simplistic lifestyle. Um, so it's sort of a, a strange anomaly, really, in the in the modern world. Even with some other indigenous cultures, um, they would have a level of sophistication uh, and advancement that's way beyond what the Aboriginals had. So um, it is unique in the whole world, and perhaps. Um, perhaps because of that, because it's u it's totally unique nature, uh, more efforts really should be made to help preserve their way of life and enable them to live um, sort of undisturbed, if you like, because that way of life and the, the modern way of life, they're not really very compatible from what I can see. Um, so I don't really know what the solution to that problem is. Uh, you know, I've heard people suggest that you know maybe that the centre of Australia should just be left to them to live in their traditional way of life. I would suggest that 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 sounds to make a lot of sense um, because one of the problems that they've had seems to be um, trying to integrate into modern life, especially when they've had like alcohol pushed on them. For generations and that is seemingly a very serious problem for them uh, to this day um, and sort of undermining their uh, their traditions and their way of life and their ability to sort of function in modern Australia so I don't really know what the solutions are but um, obviously um, if their way of life as a sort of traditional a way of living is to survive at all then something has to be done to enable them to uh, continue to live in, in that way and it would be an awful shame if that was lost because as I said it is unique in the whole world so anyway I, I had uh, also spent some time in Melbourne as I said before um, it's a great city in terms of tourism because this whole central area um, within the borders of what's called the Circle Tram is all free in terms of public transport. You can you can go anywhere you like for free. There's also free Wi-Fi, but the downside of Melbourne was very much the the homelessness and um, a lot of sort of very aggressive homeless people. I have to say. Um, some of them, I think, may have been mentally ill. In my travels, I, I run across a lot of people who were sort of talking to thin air or just shouting randomly at people and sort of shouting very aggressively at passers-by as well. And uh, in one particular instance, uh, two guys sort of were coming in a sort of pincer move. I thought they were going to mug me. And I just got the hell out of there as quickly as I could. I just literally ran down the road actually to get away from them because I wasn't going to chance being beaten up and mugged. Um, so, you know, my feelings about Melbourne is it's not really a very safe city. There was one particular road I was in which had many homeless people in. Uh, I remember walking past an ATM and there was a huge pile of excrement right next to the ATM where someone had openly defecated in the street. You know, this kind of thing is pretty awful. So, I mean, the good points about Melbourne, you know, the interesting place to see and the provisions for tourists are very much diluted by the inability to deal with this homeless problem. And I think they've set up these kind of needle clinics in certain areas, which, you know, why the government may think it's, it's helpful to these people really 
helping them to get off their heads it you know is that really helping or do these people need rehabilitation do they need some kind of um, therapy and sort of a treatment program to get them off the drugs and off the streets uh, you know surely that is a better answer than just sort of providing free needles for people to shoot up anyway um i did very much enjoy my time in australia a place i went to called banala was great that was very interesting that's uh famous for being the stomping ground of ned kelly the uh famous irish descended um I suppose you could call him a criminal, you could also call him a sort of folk hero as well, depending on your perspective. Um, anyway, that was very interesting. So anyway, um, from there, I went uh, from Australia to Auckland in New Zealand and visited a friend who lives north of uh, Auckland. Again, that was really interesting. And the um, uh, Maori culture, very different from the aboriginals in australia but uh, very interesting absolutely uh, beautiful artworks that they produce uh, lots of interesting artifacts i found in various museums and i'd get the chance to talk to a couple of people as well who were uh, who were maoris about their culture it was absolutely fascinating um yeah, it's a very beautiful country. I didn't get that much opportunity to to look around it because I was only there for, I think, six days. But um, I spent uh, quite a bit of time in Auckland itself and went to see the art galleries and museums. And um, again, like Melbourne, there's a lot of problems. It didn't seem to me quite as dangerous as Melbourne, but it was very dirty. And there were a huge number of homeless people, although the level of aggression and the sort of um, level of drug taking seemed to be somewhat less. Although, obviously, clearly, a lot of these people have nowhere to go, um, nowhere to live, very little uh, going for them. And, uh, you know, I wonder what is the government actually doing to help these people i noticed there were people distributing free food but uh going around in sort of yellow vests but they, they weren't actually from the government they were a charitable organization that was going around trying to help feed these people so you know it, it started to emerge into a pattern you know and looking you know really bad social problems um in pretty much everywhere apart from Singapore and Japan so far so anyway from from um, New Zealand I flew on a very long flight to New York a New York City somewhere I've been before and you know it when I was a lot younger I went there it was pretty dangerous I'd have to say it's even more dangerous now uh, it's full of drug taking, it's full of homeless people, and it's also incredibly expensive. Um, I had the, pro I think the most expensive meal that I paid for was actually in New York. It wasn't anything fancy, it was just sort of like a, you know, a carvery sort of cafeteria type meal, but it still was like, yeah, I think it was like $24, which seemed like an awful lot for a very mediocre meal. Uh, whereas everywhere else I've been, I found the food was cheap, apart from apart from Dublin, uh, which is you know not very far behind New York in terms of poor value for money when it comes to food. Um, the cheapest place actually was Japan. Japan uh, has had a lot of trouble with its currency. The yen has collapsed in the last six months, and so. Um, if you've got euros or pounds or US dollars, you'll have a very, very cheap time in Japan. Um, yeah, anyway, uh, you're probably well familiar with the problems in New York, so I won't elaborate on that. But from there, I flew to Toronto 
and um, I spent quite a bit of time around there. Uh, I went with a family member to um, some places outside of Toronto. Uh, if you drive north, you're into sort of proper countryside and some very nice rural towns. I mean, Canada is absolutely vast. I didn't have time to sort of go into the uh, far north of Ontario State. Um, in fact, I did get a train to um, Ottawa, which is sort of on the eastern edge of of the state, and and that took me, I think it was four and a half hours on the train to to get there. So it gives you some idea of how vast even just one state within Canada is. Um, now Toronto um, has a very strange public transport system. It has got a sort of underground, but it's not very extensive. Um, it's reliant on buses to a large extent, but at least it has a subway. One thing I notice about Auckland is it's entirely dependent on buses. There's no um, no train system to speak of, and no, you know, no kind of trams, no subway. So that was a real uh, difficult thing about Auckland for getting around. It was easier to get around on foot, to be honest, just to walk to places. Um, but with um, uh, Toronto, it, it's a little bit better, but still, you could spend hours and hours on buses. So, you know, I feel very grateful to actually have a car because it just reminded me of having worked when I was younger and having to rely on public transport to get to work. You know, it can be hot and sweaty, you know, there's no air conditioning. Um, it's often expensive public transport and doesn't always take you exactly where you want to go. Uh, and you can be quite tired, but even exhausted by the time you get where you're supposed to be going. You imagine if you've got to take small children and carry lots of shopping with you on, on buses and trams and things like that. It's not easy. So, you know, to have uh, an actual car is quite a privilege, really. I mean, a lot of people who have cars tend to take it for granted. But, um, you know, it is, it is uh, something wonderful to be able to just get in your car and drive to places and have all that kind of room for putting things like shopping in, you know and certainly dealing with young children not having to contend with public transport it's it's a real boon to be able to have a car you know so uh, uh, that kind of um, was a wake up for me to just make me realize how fortunate I am that I'm not one of these people that's 100% reliant on public transport so anyway Ottawa is quite a different city uh, that's uh, as I said I went there on the train uh, it has some really beautiful parts. There's parts of it are very run down. I noticed some streets where there was like um, drug paraphernalia on the ground, a lot of graffiti, um, sort of overgrown gardens, overgrown streets, you know, with weeds growing in the, in the gutters and on the pavements. I also saw a lot of drug taking. It would appear to be fentanyl, I think. It's probably coming from the United States. Um, the people just in a state of zombification. They weren't aggressive. They weren't um, sort of nasty or, you know, um, shouting and in the way that I'd noticed in Melbourne, which was quite frightening in some cases. These people were just too out of it to to even be aggressive. They're just like absolutely um, off their heads and so just know what's going on. I felt really bad for them actually. It's just to be in such a poor state that you just don't even know what's happening um, it's just just terrible so I can I asked a few people what was going on and you know people seem so blase about the whole thing and I found that quite shocking but I mean that's been a problem in Canada for quite some time and I think from the sound of what they were saying people you know they're not happy about it but they've just become so accustomed to it that you know, it's no longer shocking to people who live in Toronto or Ottawa. Um, they've just become acc acclimatized to seeing 
you know, people wandering around in a, a drugged out state, um, sort of homeless, poorly dressed, unkempt, unwashed. You know, I even saw a man lying in front of Burger King unconscious on the ground. And people just sort of stepped over him as if he wasn't there. Uh, so, you know, people have seemed to become very nonchalant, perhaps hardened to these quite shocking um, events of people like passing out in the middle of the street um, and just, just ignoring it. So I found that quite upsetting, I have to say. So overall, I mean, I had a great time in Canada, but some of the social problems I found quite disturbing and upsetting. Um, so anyway, that was the last place I went. I came and flew back from Canada, uh, from Toronto, back to Dublin. And um, yeah, it was great to, to come back. Um, and once again, yeah, I was struck by how expensive uh, Dublin was compared to, say, um, Canada or New Zealand or, um, and in particular, Japan. Japan was really cheap. So, as I said, uh, it Dublin is actually one of the most expensive cities in the world now. And, uh, you know, I think, yeah, as I said, the, the meal I had in New York was the most expensive I had and you know Dublin's not far behind uh, it has got a, a fairly decent public transport system but again that's not really very cheap and um, yeah it's grand if you're a tourist and you have like a big budget to spend but um, it's not such a great city to live in if you have to pay sky-high rents and uh, you know maybe you're not earning a fortune in your job it can be one of the the worst cities to live in financially speaking because the cost of food and drink the cost of accommodation um the cost of public transport it's it, it you know it's very tough for a lot of people living in in dublin so anyway i came back home back to the countryside where i live and i'm very grateful to be home Ireland in general is a very safe and uh, beautiful place to live and you know I feel grateful to live here I'm very glad that I I don't live in the middle of some awful city that's um, full of pollution full of homelessness uh, and all kinds of other social problems uh, somewhere that's incredibly dangerous because some of these cities are to be honest quite quite dangerous I was afraid to go out uh, particularly in Melbourne after like eight or nine o'clock uh, because you know by that time most you know people families and work people who are sort of dining out or whatever after work going for a drink they have normally gone home and then the people that are left on the streets are people that you probably don't want to run into if you're not sort of one of their kind of you know, community of sort of, I know, you couldn't say really what these people are, but uh, it, it didn't feel very safe. So um, I wasn't inclined to hang around at night. Um, whereas at home here, uh, I don't feel under threat. I don't feel like I'm going to be attacked or someone's going to try and... Uh, do something nasty to me. I, I think Ireland is a relatively safe country to live in. So I'm very grateful uh, for, for the life I have here. So, I mean, I had a wonderful time overall. I know I've talked about some of the negative aspects of, of my trip, but, you know, I saw some amazing stuff, beautiful countryside, amazing museums, uh, amazing art galleries, lots of beautiful architecture i got to talk to lots of interesting people as well and see a slice of life in other countries um and it's probably not something i'll ever have the opportunity to do again so i feel very privileged and fortunate to have been able to have done that so uh, yeah it was a great trip but it did make me think a lot about the inequalities 
that you find particularly in Western society and the, the problems of modern urban life and the sort of, I suppose what you could really only call ineptitude of uh, the city governing bodies and even perhaps the national governing bodies that are responsible for these cities and the, the level of inaction, the level of ineptitude in dealing with these social problems quite shocked me. I mean these things didn't just spring up overnight, these problems have been there for many years and in some cases been growing steadily worse year on year and yet very little seems to have been done about about these problems. I mean uh, Dublin now has 15,000 plus homeless people um, which is I mean Ireland has that number sorry I couldn't give you a figure on Dublin itself but Ireland has 15,000 homeless people and the government make noises about it I'm sure the governments in America and Can Canada you know Australia New Zealand they all make nice noises about dealing with these problems but uh, their in inability or unwillingness to actually deal with these problems is self-evident because you can see these people who are homeless, who are drug addicts, who are possibly mentally ill, you know, just all over the city on the streets. And, um, you know, I, I, it quite horrified me. I was quite shocked to the extent of it. And, you know, I don't really, I, you know, I'm not a politician. Um, I'm not a social worker, etc. I don't know, really know what the solutions to these problems are. But um, what's clear to me is that more effort is required to actually sort these problems out, to give these people uh, an opportunity to rebuild their lives and get off the streets and, you know, get into some kind of accommodation where they can begin the process of sorting out their personal problems and rebuilding their lives and having some kind of future that's worth living for. Anyway, um, I think that'll do for now. This is pretty long, this video. Um, thank you for watching if you're still here. If you enjoyed what I had to say, please give a thumbs up um, and you could feel free to subscribe to my channel as well. And uh, if you have any comments on the issues I've brought up, I'd be interested to hear what you have to say. Um, have you been to cities like this? Have you seen these problems? And if so, have you? what are your ideas about why these problems persist? And do you have any ideas about how these problems can actually be solved? Um, that's something I would like to think will happen in the future. Uh, who knows? But anyway, that that's probably the biggest takeaway from my, my trip was the incredible social problems that are present all over the world in, you know, different urban environments. So anyway, thank you for watching and that's it for now. Bye.